Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, we'll be reading verses 18 through 23. Isaiah 45, 18 through 23, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved images and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case, yes, let, the, let them take counsel together who has, declared, who has declared this from ancient times, who has told it from, the, from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall, be, and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. This morning, uh, Elder Zach McFadden has our message, and at this time we'll turn the service over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Good morning. I don't normally give a disclaimer before I speak, but uh, I'm going to this morning. Uh, the topic we're going to talk about is not popular in many circles of the Christian world. Um, sometimes it may get you run out of town. Uh, I hope that it won't be the case this morning because I assure you what we will talk about this morning will be solely from this book. And so I encourage you to open your Bibles. Test. Test all things by the Word of God. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning we're getting ready to open your Word, Lord. And I pray now now that you will speak to the people, Lord, not me. May your spirit move in this place and may you speak to your people, Lord. Hide me behind the shadow of the cross that they may see Jesus is my prayer in his name. Amen. It was winter of 1990. A few weeks before my 10th birthday, we were uh, making our annual pilgrimage up north to see my grandparents. And I can't remember exactly the details of what happened, but apparently my two brothers and my father had some sort of disagreement. And I wasn't around at the time it happened, but they began to convince me, they began to try to convince me of their side of what happened. And they were saying some things about my dad that, well, were untrue. And uh, you have to understand, prior to this, my dad and I were, were buddies. We were best friends. We were hardly ever inseparable. But, you know, as the, as the day went on, and I listened to it, and though I'm not proud of it, sadly, I repeated some of the things in their presence and unbeknownst to me my dad was outside the room and he overheard what I said those of you here who are parents know that sometimes your children say things that will break your heart little could I have dreamed that when I said those words my dad was just listening out of earshot and he never said a word to me 
But apparently he told my mom about it because the next day she came to me and told me that the words I said had wounded my dad deeply. So immediately I went at once to make things right with my dad and asked his forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, the same thing is going on today. Someone is saying things about our Father in heaven that are not true. Today, as we're here, there are words being spoken by many that accuse our loving Father of demonic qualities. And these lies that are being repeated involve the doctrine of eternal torment. The idea is that when a person dies in their sins without accepting Christ as Savior, they spend eternity in a burning hell where they suffer excruciating pain throughout the eternal ages. This lie has turned many away from God, such as the philosopher Bertrand Russell, who wrote these words in a book entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. He writes, There is one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character, and that is that he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. I must say that I think that all this doctrine that hellfire is a punishment for sin is a doctrine of cruelty. It is a doctrine that put cruelty into the world and gave the world generations of cruel tor torture and the Christ of the Gospels, if you could take him as his chroniclers represent him, would certainly have to be considered partly responsible for that. Brothers and sisters, Mr. Russell was absolutely correct if one considers that Christ was talking about eternal torment, the idea that God will burn people for all eternity. It would be a doctrine of cruelty. It would make our God, our Jesus, out to be a monster. And many followed the example of Mr. Russell. They've thrown the Bible and Christianity to the side and said, if God is like that, then I want nothing to do with him. And sadly, this idea is preached and preached every year from the pulpits in an effort to scare people into the kingdom, to scare people into decision for God. Let me ask you a question this morning. Can a person be scared into the kingdom? Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 21, verse 8. Revelation 21, 8. writing about those who sadly in the end will reject Christ, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and liars and idolaters shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Where do all those who are afraid end up? Where do the fearful end up? Not inside the city with Christ. They end out, outside in the lake of fire. The, you can't scare people into the kingdom, my friends. It requires a love response, not a fear response. Amen? This doctrine of hellfire has been around for a long time. But in 1731, it received its greatest impetus when a preacher named Jonathan Edwards wrote a sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This is what he said in the sermon. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over a fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath toward you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else to be, but to be cast into the fire. Skipping forward a little bit, it says, there will be no end to your exquisite, horrible misery. Is this the God of the Bible? Is this the God that loves you so much that he'll do everything possible for you to be saved, but he abhors you, he hates you, he will burn you for all eternity? 
Another preacher at that time, Samuel Hopkins, wrote, The smell of their torment shall ascend up forever and ever in the sight of the blessed. This display of divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed. And get this, the highest pleasure to those that love God. Should the eternal torment in fires be extinguished, it would in a measure great put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed. Do, do you get what he's saying? That those in heaven, their pleasure, their happiness depends largely upon watching those hop and scream around in the flames. That, that's perverse, my friends. That's a doctrine of demons. And I personally believe that both these men were absolutely wrong. They painted the loving God of the Bible as a merciless creature who loves to hurt and torture people. But the Bible presents a different picture. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But this morning, we're going to talk about sinners in the hands of a loving God. So let's start with a question. What happened when humanity sinned against God? Jesus said, this is heaven's mission statement. You can look on the websites of many companies and see their mission statement. This is what heaven stands for. For the Son of Man, this is in Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's heaven's mission statement. That's what heaven stands for. To seek and to save lost sinners, brothers and sisters. When Adam and Eve sinned, God had several options. First, he could have simply spoke a word and wiped this entire planet out. We do this when we have a virus on a computer. We wipe out this virus so it doesn't infect other files on our computer. And I know we can't understand why God didn't simply wipe sin out right away. I assure you, one day we will. Because we're going to see the whole great controversy from God's perspective. Second option, he could have abandoned the planet. He could have said, fine, they chose you, Satan. You have this planet. I'll go over here and create a new planet. He didn't do that. Third option, and many people believe this is what he did. He could have changed the law. He said, well, no more sin problem because sin is the transgression of the law. I'll change the law so there's no more breaking of the law. And the crisis is immediately over. But brothers and sisters, God didn't do that. The law of God can't be changed. It's a transcript of his character. To change the law, he would have changed the foundation of his government. God did something better. And this is option four. He became the sin sacrifice. The Bible tells us, John 3.16, what God did. Say that with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice the words should not perish. It doesn't say burn for all eternity in hell. In Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's two options. Perish, death, or eternal life through Jesus. Notice the verse says, the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. Just like a job, you do a job, you get a paycheck. The paycheck for sin is death. Look at the cross. A lot of people say, well, the payment for sin is eternal burning. Should not the payment for sin that Jesus paid match the penalty? Is Jesus still hanging on the cross, my friends? The Bible said Jesus died a death. He died a of a broken heart. Sin crushed out the life of our creator. He was willing to go to the cross for me and you. Let's look at some scriptural evidence this morning. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This morning, let's let the word of God, let's let God speak through his word and light our path this morning. Amen? Are humans mortal or immortal? 
five times in scripture, the Bible uses the word mortal to describe the condition of man. You'll believe humans are mortal, visit a cemetery. That's where the majority of people who have ever lived are. People are subject to disease and death as a result of sin. We are mortal, brothers and sisters. The only time immortals used in the Bible, 1 Timothy 1.17, and it describes an attribute of God. God is immortal. Humans are not immortal. So do humans possess an immortal soul? Let's turn in our Bibles to Ezekiel 18 verse 4 and answer this question. Is the soul immortal? Ezekiel 18, 4. And I'm going to read the last part of the verse. But it says, The soul that sins, it will die. Can a soul die? According to scripture, can a soul die? Yes. Yes. Many believe that the soul is some kind of ghostly entity that flies off to heaven at, or hell at death. But this is nowhere taught in this book, brothers and sisters. Actually, this is a teaching of paganism that crept into the church through Gnostic teachings in the early part of the second century. The Bible teaching about a soul, turn back to the book of beginnings in Genesis. Genesis 2.7. This is what the Bible says a soul is. Genesis 2, 7. In describing that moment of creation, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It doesn't say God put a soul into Adam. It says Adam was a soul. It takes the breath of life and a, and a body to create a soul, my friends. When our loved ones pass away and the breath of life goes back to heaven, there's no longer a soul. There's just a dead body. But Jesus Christ can put that body back together. He can recreate the soul. And according to the Bible... He will do that someday soon. Job 14.21, Job 14, it mentions that a person dies. Their loved ones come to pay their respects. The person doesn't even know it because the dead know nothing. You can't converse with them. There's no conversation with them. You can't ask them things about the future because the dead know nothing. Psalm 146 verse 4 says that when someone dies, that same day their thoughts perish. Your soul doesn't go back to heaven, friends. It's not a ghostly entity. It's you. When you die, that's it. It perishes. When does a person come back to life again? Turn with me to Job 14.12. Job 14.12 Bible says, so man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Okay? According to the Bible, when does a person arise? Till the heavens be no more. We're told that when Jesus comes back in Revelation 6, the sky is going to roll up as a scroll. The heavens will be no more. Notice what it says. They shall not be raised out of their sleep. The Bible calls death asleep 53 times throughout the Old and New Testaments. Before we go on, let's review what we've uncovered so far. First, human beings are mortal. The soul is the whole human being which at death perishes. And then this person enters a dreamless sleep not to rise again until the heavens be no more. It's important to understand this before we understand what happens to those that will finally reject Christ. 
Because as Christians, we know that God sent Jesus to die for us. Jesus paid the price for all humanity. We have to choose, however, to accept his death in our behalf. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Brothers and sisters, that is a promise. You can believe it. God promises that. And we know according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18, that when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ will come to life again. They will rise and meet the Lord in the air, put on immortality, never be sick, suffer, or die again. But what happens to those who reject Jesus? Let me ask you another question. Do the wicked receive eternal life? Do the wicked receive eternal life? Okay, according to Jesus 14, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. According to uh, John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. Eternal life comes by Jesus and Jesus alone. I know this is not very politically correct with a lot of the world's religions, but the truth is that anyone who will ever be saved will be saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus was more than just a man. He was the creator in human flesh that came to save us from the penalty of sin. Without Jesus, my friends, we are doomed to die the second death because there is no other way. All other ways are counterfeits that lead to the lake of fire. So let's look at what happens when a person makes a decision to reject Jesus. That person chooses death over life. They're saying to Jesus, I don't want your sacrifice in my behalf. I will pay my own penalty. What according to Romans 6.23 is the penalty for sin? Death. If the person should die then without accepting Jesus or repenting of that decision, that person has to pay their own penalty because God respects our decisions. And the penalty for sin is not eternal life in a place of torment, friends. It's eternal death. It's like a person in a hospital pulling their own plug because God is the source of life. Hell is the person saying, I don't want God anymore. That's the person experiencing what Jesus experienced on the cross to be forever separated from the Father. Let's look at what the Bible says about hell. The word hell is used 54 times in the English translations of the Bible. But there are four different words that are translated hell. Only one of them refers to a place of burning. In the Old Testament... The word Sheol is translated as hell 31 times. Sheol means the grave, the place where the dead go when they die. The New Testament, the, the word Hades is used 10 times. It's translated as grave. It's translated as hell. Hades is the same thing. So out of the 54 times, you have 41 of those that simply refer to the grave. Let me show you something very interesting. Turn with me to Revelation 20 verse 13. We're going to talk about two resurrections for, for a moment. I have the old King James Bible. If you have the new King James Bible, in this passage the word Hades is used. It says in Revelation 20 verse 13, and this is describing the resurrection of those who will be raised to receive the penalty for sin, what they've chosen. It says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death in hell, that word hell is actually the Greek word Hades, the grave, gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every one according to their works. And death in hell, Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So you see, you have the grave opening up and those coming to life who have chosen to reject Christ. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Here we have a resurrection of, of a group of different people. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. This is what the righteous say, the righteous dead when they come to life in a different resurrection. It says, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? One day as I was studying, I looked up that word grave in the Strong's Concordance, and I was shocked when I realized the same word translated grave here is Hades. The same word that in Revelation 20, 13 is translated as hell, grave, Hades. Where do the righteous and wicked dead go at death? Both go to Hades. Both go to the grave. The Bible tells us, turn to Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes rather, 6.6. 6. Ecclesiastes 6.6. 6. And the Bible tells us, has been telling us this for thousands of years. And this is talking about a person who lives and then dies. It says, yes, though he lives a thousand years two times, yet he has seen no good. Do not all go to one place. Righteous and wicked at death. We go to the grave. Hades, Sheol. But we come out of it a thousand years apart, friends. See, it matters who you know and what you've chosen, who you've chosen to be with that determines when you come out of the grave. Another word that's used for hell is one time in the Bible, the word Tartarus. And Tartarus describes a place of darkness where the demons fell after losing the war in heaven. It's the same place that's described in Genesis 1-2 where it says the earth was without form and void. Dark, darkness was upon the face of the deep. A place of darkness. We know the demons came down here. There's 12 other times that the word hell is translated from the word Gehenna. Gehenna is the burning hell, the place of, of burning. Gehenna, most of the time that's used, it's used by Jesus. Gehenna, just to give you a historical perspective, was the trash dump outside the city of Jerusalem where the Jews would dump their garbage. The bodies of animals and criminals were burned and there were worms there. The worms and fire were constantly feeding and feeding and eating the dead bodies until there was nothing left. And Jesus no doubt describes this and he was probably looking at Gehenna when in Mark 9, 44 to 48, he talks about those who in hellfire at the end of time, their worm does not die. Now many interpret this verse as the worm being the soul. But as we've already seen, the soul will die. The worm is describing how the fire will consume until there's nothing left. It's not the soul, brothers and sisters. It is what consumes those in hellfire. The Bible teaches, however, the wicked will burn forever, but not for all eternity. Now, hold on just a second. Revelation 20 verse 10 tells us the wicked will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you're saying, you say they're going to be tormented forever, but not for all eternity. How do you separate that? Well, first of all, the Greek word here is the word anion. Anion means until the end of the age or translated as long as it could occur. Well, I, mean, I was waiting one time in a traffic accident that it occurred, it took an hour to go three or four blocks. I used the word forever. I, man, this is going to take me forever to get home. Have you ever used the word like that? Are you still there? As long as it took. It, and now, biblically speaking, it did take forever. It took as long as, as it lasted for me to get from point A to point B. And the same thing. Remember, the wicked are mortal. 
They do not receive eternal life. A mortal human being, when they burn forever, they burn as long as it takes, not throughout as long as God will live throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Is everybody following me? The dead are judged according to their works. Some burn longer than others because let's face it, there's been some really bad people on this planet. But the wages of sin is death, not the burning that precedes it, the death that will come for all. Malachi 4.3 tells us, you will tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under your feet. Notice, the wicked are reduced to ashes. The righteous don't walk around on some intact, burning, screaming body. They walk on ashes. Sodom and Gomorrah are described as being reduced to ashes. About 25 years ago, they found the sites of Sodom and Gomorrah. And brothers and sisters, I've seen pictures. They are ashes. There's nothing there. Brings up a point. Someone wrote a book that described hellfire as 10,000 degrees or more. Well, I talked to a friend of mine who's a funeral home director, and he told me that in order to cremate a body, it requires a heat of about 1,300 to 1,800 degrees. So this brings up a point. Why can we, as human beings, kindle a fire that reduces a body to ash that is supposed to be much cooler than what God can create, but God creates a fire that's at least five times hotter, but it doesn't even get the job done. It just keeps people around. Brothers and sisters, God is not going to create a fire that even he himself can't put out. Read the Psalms. Especially Psalm 37. It describes the wicked as destroyed, burned up. They are no more. Even the memory of them is forgotten, friends. God doesn't torture the wicked for all eternity. I mean, what's, what's the love? What's the justice in that? What could you do for 70, 80 years that would require you burning for billions of years? That would make God out to be a worse monster than Adolf Hitler, friends. Our God is a God of love. He's a God of justice, but he's a God of love, my friends. God does not burn people now. Imagine how unfair it would be if someone were to die tonight and according to the popular idea, they went down to receive their penalty right now before their trial, but someone has died a thousand years before and they're burning for a thousand years longer. That, that's not a God of love and, and fairness. I mean, our court systems can be rather corrupt. God's court system is just, it's fair. 2 Peter 2.9 says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Have you ever made a reservation for a restaurant? When you get there, there's no longer need for the reservation. You're given the seat. You're given the table. The wicked are reserved by their choice for the day of punishment that is yet to come. Brothers and sisters, the righteous are reserved by their choice for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where I want to be. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 40 to 42, the wicked would be punished after the end of the age. Not now, after he comes again, after there's no more sky, friends, after it recedes. They'll come to life. They will be punished. There's another mis common misconception that the devil is in charge of hell. But it, Ezekiel 28, 18 through 19 tells us the devil's going to be destroyed in hellfire. You can read books. Test them by the word of God, friends. A lot of these popular books say, oh, the devil was in charge of hell. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says hell was created for the devil or will be created for the devil. He's not going to be in charge of hell. God is not going to employ some sadistic monster on his payroll for all eternity. It's not going to happen. God will not eternally torment those who reject him, but he will kindle a fire that will eradicate sin. Many are afraid of the Father. Brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of the Father. 
Remember John 3, 16? The Father loves you. He sent the Son to die for you. There's no conflict in the Godhead. You don't have Jesus wanting to save you and the Father wanting to destroy you. They're all united with one purpose. In 1 John chapter 5, it says that all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are united. The same word is used when it describes husband and wife being united in marriage. Don't be afraid of the Father. The Father loves you more than you can even imagine. And he's doing everything, everything he can to save you. He's given Jesus. He's given the angels. He gives you gifts. He gives you the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. And he pleads with you. He begs you. He's not in the habit of destroying sinners. He will because he has to at the end of time. But we have to be the ones. We have to be the ones to say, I don't want it anymore. Leave me alone. Because in, until then, my friends, he's going to beg. He's going to plead. He's going to knock. He's going to do everything he can to save you. Because God's in the habit of getting you into heaven, not keeping you out. We have only a few fleeting moments on this earth. Consider eternity brothers and sisters make the most of these moments listen to that still small voice gently and tenderly calling you softly and tenderly Jesus is calling brothers and sisters we are blessed to be sinners in the hands of a loving God he's willing to risk everything to bring us home I want to be honest with you this morning look at the world around you do you see the signs Jesus is coming soon, brothers and sisters. Consider that. Where do you want to spend eternity? With Jesus in heaven or... Without God, there's no life. It's our choice. God made a choice 2,000 years ago at the cross. He made a choice before the creation of the world. Sporting, I want to appeal to you. The devil has attempted to discredit our Father because he knows that we're drawn to the Father because of the Son. Don't believe the lies of Satan. Find the Father, my friends. Find the truth about the Father. The Bible's been preaching the truth about the Father for over 4,000 years. Jesus is coming soon. Maybe there's someone here who has not accepted Christ as Savior. I want to give you the opportunity to do that. In a moment, we're going to have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'm going to pray. Maybe there's someone here who's, or listening to my voice, that has um, accepted this doctrine of eternal torment. And today the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart. Or someone here who's abandoned Christ and you want to come home. Listen to the Spirit of God. He's calling you. Today's your moment. There may never be another one again. And someone... Maybe has that walk with the Lord and you feel God calling you to a higher calling, to an additional place in his vineyard. I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk directly to the Father in just a moment. In fact, let's bow our heads right now and give you a moment of silent prayer.
Holy Lord, you see, you hear all. We're blessed to be sinners in the hands of a loving God. Today, many voices knowingly and unknowingly accuse you of diabolical qualities, qualities that the devil himself would do had he won the war. But we are thankful that Jesus has won the war and that you as a fair and just God will treat those who ultimately reject you with as much love as you treat those who accept you, Lord. I praise you that though you are not responsible for the sin problem, that you will put an end to it. Lord, this morning here, maybe there was someone who, who just this moment began a new relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you be with the, that person. Those who have returned to you today, Lord, pray that you continue to be with them and strengthen them. Those who you've called for a deeper walk with you, Lord, I pray that you'll, your spirit will open their hearts and open their minds. Lord, may we as Christians take heed of the signs, take heed of the nearness of the event that Jesus is coming soon. And may we fulfill the mission that you've given us, Lord, to tell the world about a loving God. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It's never meant for the human race. There are many who will choose it. But Lord, I just pray that each person here and each person that's listening to the sound of my voice, that they will endeavor to be in heaven with the one that loves them more than anything. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.